basically what we're seeing is a, is a profound split in the Tory party about when and how uh, to lift the lockdown. Um, you've got Rishi Sunak wanting to lift it sooner than others. Uh, you've got Matt Hancock wanting it to, you know, to stay in place. This should be from uh, the Times. Taxpayers will pay the wage of a million people at a cost of more than one billion after 144,000 companies hit by coronavirus applied for government support in a single day. Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, said that employers would receive grants in six days to pay staff who had been furloughed as the government opened its coronavirus job retention scheme. Experts believe the unprecedented intervention will eventually cost the government more than £40 billion and that 8.3 million people could apply. Basically, in one day yesterday, the number of people on the government payroll increased by 20%. Uh, as a uh, as a result of this furlough scheme, by the end of it, many many more people will be on the the the, the furlough scheme uh, than probably are on government payrolls. Uh, we'll see how many adopt it, but that, that's how it's looking right now. They said forty billion, uh, but then Rishi Sunak said last week it was going to be extended by a month. So now we're probably looking at about fifty billion. Then you look at weird stuff like the global downturn in regards to oil prices. Uh, do you think, Michael, that the Tories are looking at, then you look at the data around a global, um, a UK downturn, a 35% economic contraction. Do you think the Tories look at the deficit they're going to run? They look at the state of the economy, the other side of this. Uh, they look at global variables and, and they think, actually, you know what? Okay, 100,000 people might die, 200,000 people might die. Uh, but we'll, we'll and, and, and hey, the health system might collapse, but we'll, we'll take that over the alternative of a 20% deficit you know, uh, debt to GDP going to 140, 150%. Um, uh, China taking great swathes of the global market. Do, do you think there's a calculation going on there right now in, inside the Conservative cabinet? Because that's that's how it seems. Well, I doubt there's anyone in the Conservative cabinet who is willing to allow for a situation where the NHS collapses. I think the big turning point for the government when they decided to move from their sort of herd immunity, let's let it run through the population and kill 100,000 people, which seemed like that was their original mm. um, estimate, was one, there was a bit of pushback from the public, but also they realised that actually, you know, older people and, and vulnerable people dying earlier is one thing. Seeing our ICU capacities overflowing you know seeing hospitals in absolute crisis mm. um and and our health system on the on the brink of collapse i think they decided actually that would not be that would not be politically but isn't, isn't that so visceral isn't that Sorry, a short-term thing though i mean so you, you could you could basically say okay we're gonna have two hundred thousand people die but you can massively increase icu capacity by the ventilators by the system i'm not suggesting i'm not suggesting they're going to give up on that i'm not suggesting they're going to just mm. adopt herd immunity wholesale what, what they could be thinking is, okay, because this, this furlough scheme goes through to June, which is several months. Mm -hmm. We build multiple more NHS Nightingales. We get all the testing kits. Uh, you know, We do a bit of track and trace or quite a bit of track and trace. But ultimately, given the scale of the potential economic hit, actually, we're going to prioritize the economy over minimizing human casualties. Do, yeah, do you not no. think that calcul calculation is being made? That's being made. Yeah, yeah, that's being made. I just wanted to... I don't think any of them would want to let it run right to the degree that the NHS is overwhelmed and collapses. That's, that's all I'm saying. So I think I think the debate is between uh, the people who want to flatten the curb and the people who want to, which has always been, you know, the government's official policy, mm -hmm. um, but they've never been quite clear about what they mean by that. And people who want to stop transmission altogether so that we can introduce some sort of test and trace system. And the differences between these two are, you know, the big policy debate, which is going on throughout the world at the moment, which is whether you want, and the technical way of talking about it is whether you want R, which is the reproduction rate of, of COVID-19 to be very close to zero, or whether you're happy so long as it's below one. And for the transmission rate of it to be below one, you need social distancing measures, you know, until there's a vaccine. Um, but you don't need to completely, you know, destroy the disease. So a lockdown that we've got now is probably having the, trans, the transmission rate, up, you know, a fair bit below one, but not really close to zero. And mm. so what Rishi Sunak and people will be arguing is that we can open up much bigger sections of the economy than we currently are. Um, so long as, you know, to keep the, trans the, keep the transmission rate below one, which means that we'll see basically a steady amount of infections and a steady amount of deaths. So we could be seeing, you know, 200 deaths a day for um, a year even. You know, that, that, that's quite possible on the mm. sort of let's keep the transmission rate steady. The other argument, um, and this is what's, you know, like the hammer and the dance strategy, is you say we have a really serious lockdown to try and get transmission almost at zero. So 
barely any transmission in the community whatsoever. And after that, we introduce a very sort of aggressive test and trace system, which means that wherever uh, COVID-19 pops up, we try and, you know, surround it and contain it. And I think that's the debate going on in government whereby, you know, and the argument for the second one is that you could actually have more economic growth in that one because you don't need much of a lockdown at all if you've got an aggressive test and trace system. But the argument that Rishi Sunak and people I presume will be putting forward is to say, yes, that's lovely in theory, but for us as a state to be able to develop a, a system of test and trace, which is effective, will take us a few more months and we can't handle a few more months trying to keep the transmission rate close to zero. Um, I also think, I mean, James, James's point was incredibly prescient, which, I, I, which is, I think this probably isn't about what's going to be the ultimate bill, um, but it is about international competitiveness. So what you hear from the people who want to basically just end the lockdown and, and go for herd immunity and sort of fuck the dead mm -hmm. is to say, look, if we, if we continue this lockdown, that's going to necessitate a set, like, you know, there's going to be no choice but to have austerity afterwards, which is going to mean lots of poor, miserable people. And obviously, that is something you have to push back against because austerity is always going to be a political choice. And I think, you know, James's point that this is actually about who gets to come out of lockdown first, because then they get a competitive edge against other countries or their, you know, their competitors. That's that's the real beef that they're having in cabinet at the moment. But of course, that's wrong because you come out too quickly and you don't deal with it effectively, and uh, you have a second wave where where it could potentially be far worse than the the first. So I suppose there's a calculation there. And do, do you, from what it sounds like to me, they're not really erring on the side of caution, though. Like you see with China, you had the lockdown. You then had this traffic light system, which is being touted here as well. Uh, and basically everybody on their phone, uh, hundreds of millions of people within the Alipay uh, uh, mobile payment system was given a QR code based upon their age, who they've been in contact with, where, where they were situated and so on, and whether they could use trains buses go to work and so on if you had red you couldn't really move you know if you're orange you're sort of similar-ish but you can do you know necessary things and if you're green you can kind of go where you like um but it sounds to me there's a few things here so at firstly i think britain doesn't have the technological infrastructure to do a lot of this stuff as mm. quickly as the chinese that's the first thing i mean i was saying about a month ago we probably need a universal online payment system to, to sort of back end a lot of this stuff it was oh we haven't got the time to do that uh, and we could have started to build that with the furlough scheme for instance uh, and had had the kind of the big data sets that you're going to need to deal with tens of millions of people and so on. But anyway, so we, we haven't got the capacity to do that. Uh, but secondly, it, it just seems like it just seems like there's not the political leadership to be that to, to take to take a decision of that scale and ag against public sentiment, which, as, as you've highlighted mm. so many times, is this is like the most I don't like the word popular because nobody actively wants it, but people are actively consenting to it more than pretty much more than anybody could have ever expected in terms of it prohibiting their their sort of uh, their lives. What, mm. what do you think, quickly, before we go to questions, what do you think the Labour Party should do? I mean, this is a very popular policy. Uh, uh, people really like it. It's clearly going to minimise um, loss of life. But at the same time, you know, there is going to be a major economic downturn. Many people are going to lose their jobs. Many businesses will go out of business, frankly, if this, if this stayed in place till say September, October, there's lots of business that goes to the wall, not just big ones, small ones do. So what, what do you think Labour should do? I mean, the, the emphasis has been on the exit plan. I've disagreed with that. I think, it just, I think it's a bit vacuous personally. Other than the health stuff, which obviously there's loads of easy wins, track and trace, PPE, ventilators. What else do you think Labour could be sort of going big on? Well, I think the Labour Party should be going big on test and trace, right? And, and saying an aggressive enough test and trace policy that we are able to essentially suppress this this disease until a vaccine comes about. And and so to not go for slow herd immunity. The other thing is to, is to push the government on precisely what their their plan is. And this is what where I think Labour have been kind of weak because they're basically just saying, can you tell us what your exit strategy is mm. instead of pointedly asking, is this your exit strategy? And so one exit strategy, which isn't insane, and it's sort of what Sweden are doing, is you say, look, if we have moderate social distancing measures, which are currently in place in Sweden, we can keep the transmission rate at around one, which means that it will, you know, it will move through the, the population steadily, but it, but not in an exponential way, which means that, you know, we can remain within the, the capacity of our, of our health service. But quite a lot of people will die. 
Um, so a lot of people will die, but the system won't collapse. That might well be the Conservatives' policy. And if it is, they should be forced to lay it out. The other option is that their policy is, is to say, we're going to suppress this virus and have aggressive test and trace. If I was the Labour Party, I'd be saying, look, the aggressive test and trace one is, is the right policy. And we should then, we should therefore remain in lockdown until um, we have the capacity to do an aggressive test and trace system, which means that we don't have thousands more people or you know hundreds dying a day um, until a vaccine is found. Uh, we're going to get a question very shortly. I just want to say, you know, the, the, I was talking about this before that we started the show. Uh, do you know how long it took to develop the, the most rapidly developed vaccine in human history, Michael? Four years, because I heard years. you say it, yeah. yeah. Four years for months, and yeah, everybody's saying, oh, 18 months, as if it's already happened, uh, which is, is quite a concern. And then mm. another really interesting story is the fact that, okay, it's one thing to create the vaccine, but given, obviously, the global demand for it, 8 billion, 7 billion people, we don't want 7 billion doses, uh, Britain doesn't actually have the domestic manufacturing capacity to, to, to generate 40, 50, 60 million doses of vaccine. Even the US, which has domestic pharmaceutical companies that could do it, um, it is, is going to really struggle. And people might say, well, you've got GlaxoSmithKline. Apparently, GlaxoSmithKline doesn't manufacture its vaccines in the UK. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's quite a major thing that, again, it's quite like Labour identifying, OK, well, if you want to talk about an exit strategy, OK, well, even if there is a vaccine developed in two years, there's absolutely no way of diffusing it quickly enough to the, to the population at large. How are we going to do that? Nobody's talking about it. And that's precisely why the Conservatives, you know, favoured policy and people still, many people still think it is their policy is herd immunity, which is to say, let's let it move through the population, but much slower than they were letting it move through the population before. And I suppose the argument that you could make, you know, as, as Rishi Sunak as well for that is to say that Unless we go for a herd immunity strategy, everything we do is going to fundamentally undermine our worldview. So the longer we stay in lockdown, the more people are receiving and relying on, on government support. I think one of the reasons the lockdown is, is, is popular is because, you know, everyone wanted to live through the blitz. You know, the, the, when people always talk about this blitz spirit, everyone wanted to live in a society with some purpose where they got to sort of like think I'm in the same struggle as my neighbours. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of happening. And it's it's dependent on a lot of state support, which is a threat to the kind of you know, economic policy that Rishi Sunak might want to implement. And the same thing with these, with the test and trace system, it just, re it requires a level of government intervention, which a country like China and a country like South Korea, and even Germany mm. are comfortable doing. But I think there are people at the top of the Conservative Party who think that, you know, it's not worth saving 100,000 lives if it means undermining our whole economic worldview. Mm.